I, uh, I got interested in neuromorphic computing about 1970 when there was a little bit of activity at Stanford. By the time I arrived at Stanford for graduate study, uh, the professor had moved. So everything got postponed for a while, but uh, in the meantime, I've continued my interest in recent years. So when we did the autonomous vehicle challenges, the first one I inspired the high school team, and then we did our own team the second time around, and I looked at that, and I said, you know, you really need something more brain-like. And so I la launched this Bjork biomimetic, biomimetic real-time cortex, which uh, has now been alive for about 10 years. And um, in the process of working on this pretty advanced research in terms of the timelines, I looked at the autonomous vehicle progress that's been dramatic thanks to DARPA. And so I thought, you know, reliability is an issue here. And I got, I got very interested in neurons and astrocytes, and, but I got really concerned about reliability. And so now that I'm obsessed, I thought I'd talk about it for a few minutes. And I, the talk promises a lot more than I'm giving because I want to focus on reliability today. So, whoops. Right. Okay, so basically, nanoscale devices can be unreliable. And so that could be a problem with future systems, especially neuromorphic systems where you need um, many, many transistors to implement details of neurons. So looking at biological neurons, they don't fire with certainty and sometimes they fire spontaneously. The outcomes can vary. There's variability in the ion channel in the axon hillock. There's variability in the synapses. And it turns out, I use the word variability. I don't say that it's random. I don't say that it's stochastic. There's some belief that some of the behavior is actually chaotic, which is characterized by equations, but it's still highly nonlinear. At any rate, that variability means that maybe there's a problem or maybe we can leverage that in terms of neuromorphic systems. In spite of that, our biological brains are surprisingly incredibly fault tolerant, uh, redundant, reliable, and so let's see what we can do about applying this. So, I looked at how do we use the biological reliability and fault tolerance mechanisms in neuromorphic circuits, and I didn't really do that on purpose. I just kept including more and more biological behavior into our neurons, and then looking back, I said, oh, we've built something that's reliable. So at any rate, so there's a couple ways to look at this. You can, within a neuron, you can look at the biological mechanisms and make those mechanisms uh, implemented in the neuromorphic circuits, but you can also look at an entire neural network and use the biological mechanisms in the entire network to lead to neuromorphic um, reliability. So if you look at biological behavior, people have already talked about um, multiple vesicles and the vesicles open, they don't open, they don't have the same number of neurotransmitters. The receptors on the Ion channels in the synapse don't behave properly. So you can see that there's a lot of randomization. So one of the first exercises that we did in, con in conjunction with Chang Wuzhou was to build uh, a, a, a synapse out of a carbon nanotube transistor. If you look at Zhou's uh, nanotransistor, all those little wires are carbon nanotubes. And look, there are a lot of them in parallel to build a single transistor. And so we're not relying on a single ion channel, we're not relying on a single synapse. We're saying let's look at variability and have redundancy. Okay. So also neuromorphic synapses, because they, they demonstrate variable behavior, uh, you can see that there are useful things that you might be able to do. And so just because we could, because we're a university and we're not uh, we're just exploring the world of, of the brain. We said, okay, let's build some variable behavior. And so you can see here in this slide uh, where there's on the left, there's a spiking, spikes coming into a neuron and the green line that's faint that you can barely see 
is the, is the actual um, postsynaptic response of the, of the synapse to behavior. On the right, we added noise, and so we added noise inside the neuron itself, and so the postsynaptic uh, potential is varying all over the place as a result. And so we were able to show that synapses do vary, and you can do some interesting things. The next slide shows that, okay, now we have these variable synapses, what can you do with them? So you can see the, <clears throat> the top right uh, traces are time versus uh, number of trials, and you can see that with a constant postsynaptic potential, you're actually getting uh, variability in timing. But when you add the variability in timing of the axon hillock and the variability in firing, along with the variability in the synapse, you can see the lower right trace where you've got um, much more reliability in timing as a result of two different noisy phenomena occurring in the same neuron. And this seems to happen biologically in a lot of places, and so it's worth modeling. So sometimes having multiple synapses for each post presynaptic, postsynaptic neuron pair also helps because then you've got more redundancy. That increases the odds that the information is received, and we've done some experiments to show that as well. Not quite so interesting. And then a comment that you can, of course, build a TMR neuron. Um, you can do, do trimodular redundancy just like the old school methods, and you can make things more reliable. Um, you can do that. It's probably not the best way to implement reliability in these kind of biomimetic circuits. So um, we looked at things like signal persistence. If a signal comes in because of a spike and it persists, then it's more likely to be useful even if other spikes are arriving in a non-deterministic fashion. So temporal summation can occur. And the, the, um, what we're showing here on the right is a, a little diagram of our first synapse and how we demonstrated temporal summation here because we had two spikes coming in and they can add even though the spikes are separated in time. So these are the kind of mechanisms that occur in biology and it just makes sense to include them in a biomimetic circuit if you're modeling neurons in the detail that we are. So um, one of the things that we've been looking at for quite some time, in fact most of the decade that we've been working on this, is that um, dendritic um, inputs are coming in to, uh, to neurons in some sort of a geographical significance. So location matters. So if inputs are coming out on the same dendritic branch, then you sometimes see a dendritic spike, like you heard about earlier today. And so these dendritic spikes mean that a small number of presynaptic neurons can cause a neuron to spike. And that's a valuable thing. And the reason it's valuable is because it increases reliability. Because you can get spiking behavior more easily than if you don't look at location and you don't include this nonlinear dendritic spiking in the, in the mix. So then we looked at um, building dendritic spiking, and that was one of the um, major experiments that we've done in the past decade is to include all sorts of dendritic spikes. There are many different kinds of dendritic spikes. There are calcium spikes, there are NMDA spikes, there are sodium spikes, and those have different impacts. And some of the spikes cause the neuron to be less responsive for a short period of time. Others cause it to be more responsive. Also, it depends on whether the neuron that's receiving these spikes actually fires, and if it does, the back propagation can cause these um, dendritic spikes to be more likely or less likely. So there's a lot going on within an individual neuron. So anyway, we looked at what if I take <clears throat> neurons with active dendrites, and I don't have any input jitter, but I do have some other variability. If you look at the top trace, you can see that you get reliable spiking out, even with, with no jitter. Uh, without active dendrites, you get a lot more variation. Now we're going to add jitter to the input. 
When we add jitter, jitter to the input, then you, you see on the traces on the right that we have enormous amount of variation when we don't have active dendrites and we have a lot less spiking. So the probability of spiking goes way down. So the active dendrites enhance the probability of spiking and also the timing reliability. And that's a biological uh, phenomenon that we modeled in our circuits. So that's another way to increase reliability. Timing seems to be exquisitely important. And the timing of uh, a number of inputs coming in that is, that is not uh, synchronous causes a lot of problems with firing unless nonlinear mechanisms are included to allow uh, spiking to occur in spite of that. So let me just skip over this. So <clears throat> in other words, spiking patterns can also result in reliability mechanisms. Because if you have, say, a burst of spiking, that's certainly more likely to get the postsynaptic neuron's attention. So even when um, you have identical pathways and individual neurons fail, then you can have uh, the neural network to continue functioning. But one thing that we've been looking at is glial cells, and in particular astrocytes. Astrocytes interact with neurons and they induce synchronous firing. They do other things as well that we've been studying, but one of the things that seems to be the most significant is the synchronous firing. So let's look at glial cells. The, the yellow and green are the glial cells, and they span hundreds of neurons and uh, thousands of synapses. And they're sensing what's happening, and they're, to some extent, they're controlling what's happening. And so the glial cells can control blood flow, which is kind of like power management, and they can also control propagation speed, but they also affect processing and memory. And glial cells can uh, potentiate synapses or they can depress synapses. So there's a lot going on, that, and we've modeled a fair amount of this. Um, in the, in the uh, last century, glial cells were thought to be like the housekeepers, the nursemaids, they provide the nutrition, they're the janitors, they clean everything up. No, it turns out that the astrocytes are doing something else, and it's pretty interesting. So just to give you a sense of the circuits, uh, this is a one of our synapse circuits, and it doesn't have all of the control knobs that, all are, that we've investigated, but it has a number of them, and we've added extra capabilities so that the uh, astrocytes can contribute both current and voltage into the synapse. In the focus right now of the synapse is to add slow inward currents, uh, calcium currents coming from the astrocyte because these slow inward currents actually dominate what happens in the neuron. They're so massive in terms of charge flow that they can cause a neuron to spike in a very precisely controlled fashion in terms of timing. So, this is the kind of network that we built to, to show um, the control an astrocyte has over spiking. So I just wanted you to see that there are, um, this is not, these are not trivial circuits. Um, but here's the test bench, and this is, a, I'll explain this in more detail. So I've got four neurons, N1, N2, N3, and N4 on the left, and they're uh, associated with part of an astrocyte a micro domain, because astrocytes have many, many compartments in our model. So one micro domain is like one compartment, and then the neurons on the right, N5, N6, N7, N8, are all in a different micro domain, a different compartment. But the micro domains communicate, calcium waves flow between them, and so you have charge flowing. <coughs> so what I want to show here is that neuron seven is not connected to neuron eight at all, except through the microdomain. And so the microdomain M1 is going to influence microdomain M2. So when N1 through N4 are spiking, they're active and they're gonna influence M1. M1 influences M2. That influences all four of the neurons on the right. Then neuron seven and neuron eight that were just spiking away and they weren't synchronized in any way, there were some phase differences in the spiking. 
uh, become synchronized when the micro domain is activated. So our simulations show, if you look on the left, you see that <clears throat> neuron seven and neuron eight, the red and black trace are not synchronized, so they're not spiking at the same time. As soon as we inject slow inward currents via the astrocytes, the neurons begin to synchronize. And then when the slow inward currents are removed, again on the right of that trace, you see that the uh, neurons become unsynchronized. So showing synchronization of neural behavior is probably important. And some, some neuroscientists believe that it's important for uh, focus, for concentration, for learning, for memory, for many different things. So we build mechanisms, we're engineers. And so we're building mechanisms that neuroscientists observe and believe to be important. And so uh, that's, that's our, our role. Our, our role is to take the, the hammer and the screwdriver and make everything work because we're engineers. So uh, at any rate, uh, at the same time, we started looking at structural plasticity. We started looking at <clears throat> something called the barrel cortex of the rat. And the rat has whiskers, and the whiskers are its primary sensory input. I know that mouse visual systems are being studied a lot now. It's very interesting because the visual cortex in humans is so massive. But in, in these rats, the barrel cortex takes the whisker inputs, and it's very important. And so I have two neurons on the left, neuron one and neuron two, and those two neurons are taking in signals from two different whiskers. And I'm gonna clip one of the whiskers. And when I clip the whisker going to neuron one, it ceases to be able to influence the neural network. And instead, in a biological rat, the neurons remap so that neuron two starts having more impact because that whisker is still sending signals. And so we built um, a remapping circuit that shows when there's activity, um, everything is fine and both neurons keep influencing neuron three, but when neuron one gets, becomes silent and stays silent for some fairly long period of time, <clears throat> that uh, the result is that neuron two takes over and neuron two will claim the synapse from neuron one that is leading to uh, the third soma and then that's able to remap in a way that the biological neurons remap. So this is believed to be um, a biological phenomenon that people have reported on and we have shown that you can do this. How does this rec uh, pertain to reliability? Well, if you have sensors failing, then you can remap to avoid those sensors. And so that's a useful thing. It's also useful if you have a prosthetic device and you have inputs coming from the brain and some of the inputs coming from the brain to the prosthetic device are gonna be silent due to some uh, damage or stroke, then uh, you, other neurons are sending signals and maybe you can remap so that the other signals are gonna actually get to the prosthetic device. So at any rate, there's, uh, we believe that there are many, many mechanisms that you can exploit that show up in biology. And these are just a handful that I've tossed out based on what we've implemented in the past few years. Um, there's, there's other mechanisms, but right now I wanna just say that we have built a lot of biological mechanisms, probably more than any other group in the United States with the exception of a couple of groups that are very strong in, in the modeling area. And so um, we've built all these mechanisms and they're turning out to be useful. So I think it's always useful to, to revisit our neurons that we're building electronically and saying maybe we should make them more, more complicated. What we're starting to do now is to worry about self-awareness. Because especially with autonomous vehicles, you would like the autonomous vehicle to have some sense of, of self-awareness, uh, some sense of self-reflection. And so we're looking at something that is a little bit closer to consciousness than we have looked at in the past. We're not the only ones, but I think very few neuromorphic community researchers are looking at this. But it seems to be, me to be important. Um, 
when the lead singer of Maroon 5 starts talking about updating his brain on the internet, then I think that this community has arrived. We have the general public's interest and it's, it's worth discussing the role of neuromorphic circuits at a higher level. Thank you.